Hey everybody, it's Mr. Allen over at the Smith Hill Library in Providence, Rhode Island, and it's time for another model building workshop. And today we're going to be looking at the Stewart Light Tank. This is the U.S. Army's Light Tank M3, the Stewart. So this was invented in 1941 by the United States. And this thing saw action in the early parts, well, for the United States, the early parts of the war. You could probably say the middle part of the, of the war for the war in general, since it started in 39. Um, so this is uh, an American tank, and this was exported to many different countries. So this served with the British, the, uh, the Russians, and the Canadians, Australians, etc. So this saw a lot of use. Uh, most of the combat this thing saw for the Americans was either in the Pacific or in North Africa. So the Stuart was nicknamed the Honey by the British because apparently the British thought it was a really sweet ride. So this tank was a very uh, fast, agile, uh, comfortable well, for a tank, uh, easy to maintain, easy to operate, and basically a honey of a tank to the British and to anybody else that used it too. So it was very reliable, very dependable, good tank. Uh, so this saw fighting in North Africa and the Pacific, as I mentioned, and it served as a main combat tank for a little bit of the war, like 41, 42. And then as what tends to happen in combat and in war, uh, the enemy, uh, namely the Germans, began to invent bigger, stronger, nastier tanks. So this quickly became outclassed. So it continued to serve on in a reconnaissance and scout role throughout the uh, European campaign, but continued to serve as a battle tank in the Pacific where it was still considered effective against Japanese armor. Although the Sherman tank, which tended to follow, became the backbone of the Allied armies at that point. Uh, aside from the Russians, of course, they had their own T-34 and other things that they were working with. So, this is a Tamiya kit from the 1970s, I'm thinking. It's an old kit, but it's a good kit, and it's still uh, readily available. It's one we've certainly done here at the Model Building Workshop with youth. Uh, it is uh, kid-friendly for a tank model. This isn't bad. So, let's take a look at it. So here's the instruction sheet, typical of a older Tamiya kit. Kind of a one sheet deal. And on this page it has you know, some photos and it has the story, a little history of it, or a lot of history depending, <laughs> depending on your reading uh, desires. <laughs> Uh, and then it goes to a decal and painting guide, which it does give you a number of options here in the kit. And there's plenty of other things you can do with this kit aside from this here. Uh, but it does give you, let's see, two American versions. Let's see, one used in North Africa during the battles in the Sahara Desert and Libya, Algeria, and... Uh, Actually, yeah, Morocco. And uh, there's a British version here, which is used also in North Africa. And there's a Canadian version, which would have been used in Europe, and another American version, which is also used in Europe. So there's a lot of choices here that you can work with. We have pretty much have done all of these in the model building workshop, so I may be looking at something different with this since it was used by so many different countries, including Russia. And then there's a lot of these that were captured. So these were used by the Germans. The Japanese used them also. And I've got an oddball one I discovered, which I'll talk more in future episodes, of the Hungarians capturing one of these from the Russians and then using it. Uh, and that opened up some possibilities in my mind because you know that may be something fun to use with this kit here. This is the mini-art Hungarian tank crew. So it's, it's a thought in my head, 
of doing this in a Hungarian version, working with one of these crew members. So, not sure yet, but that's the fun of this hobby, is exploring the possibilities, right? You can also do this kit in a good diorama with something like this, you know, because Tamiya makes so many great figure sets, and there's other companies out there that do this too. So this is the American infantry in Europe. So many possibilities. So let's take a look at the assembly on this kit, shall we? So there's not a whole lot to this model. Not really. So I'll give you a look here. There's a handful of steps. This has the old style rubber band treads. Try to get them out of the box here. You know, this style where you put the pins through and you have to melt, melt them on or staple them. But that's how these work. So they're pretty simple, really. So if you're working with kids, you would just have to do the melting part or the stapling part for the treads. Because the melting is kind of tricky. Like it talks about it here with a, using a heated nail or I've done a heated screwdriver. You put the pins through and you kind of melt the tops so that it stays together. All right, so let's take a look at some of this. I can hold the sheet so I can work with it. So this one's starting with the suspension. This has an interesting suspension system on it, as you see here. Not a whole lot of wheels, a little unconventional design to work with, but this is typical of early American armor. And maybe one piece hull piece here. There's the top of the hull here. So this is built to be, you know, not a complicated kit. even included some printouts from the internet of different ways these tanks looked because I was thinking about all kinds of different things to do with this model. So here's one here. So what's this one? That's an Australian version. There's an American version there. And there's even a very colorful British version like that. Anyway, it has a lot of possibilities. I've even seen a Brazilian version of this, too. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these wheels. So, let's see. They want to get the drive sprocket together. So, piece numbers eight and nine. I have... Got these old clippers here I want to work with. Which makes this a little easier. Just do these. So I'll do some to give you the idea how this goes together. Take a look. Do have an exacto knife here for adults. <laughs> uh, this can be sharp, it looks like. Try to get that part. So it looks like. Yeah, there's a little bit of plastic in the way there. That's not a good way to start a kit. to be able to get this pin to fit in there. Let me look. Oh, there it goes. Okay. I was going to say, because the Tamiya kits usually fit together really nicely. They don't normally fight back too much, and this one's not. Just have a small bit of extra glue, that, uh, yeah, extra plastic in the way there. 
but not enough that see how quickly it took care of that. All right, just make sure these teeth line up because you want to make sure that they they're even so that okay. See how the threads will fit on there. You can see that. You want to make sure that the teeth line up right. You don't want them like meh because then they're going to sag and it's going to create a problem. But it should pop in like it just did so that you hopefully can't make a mistake. So there's a drive sprocket. Now let's see what else we have. We have the, uh, the rear idler wheel. This is the back wheel. Apparently the idler wheels in the back were adjustable so you could adjust the track tension because sometimes you'd want the track to be really tight if you're going on a road, but if you're climbing like a mountainside or something rocky or difficult, you want a little bit of uh, sag in the tracks to be able to navigate the rough terrain. So you could adjust the tension, I guess, on the tracks depending on what kind of terrain you were in. As I mentioned, you know, these fought all over the place. So they spent a lot of time in the sands of the desert in the jungles of the Pacific and in the snow covered plains of Russia and of course in urban centers throughout Europe. So these fought in all kinds of different climates and terrain. Okay, so let me see where the arms for this are. I need piece number 13 and 14. All right, 13's down here. So these are the arms for this design. It, it's almost uh, looks like something you'd find on a train, the way this was designed. I need number four on this one. If I can get in there. Okay. So I'm going to use my handy dandy nail file. These are in like fluorescent pink, which is great if you drop them, you'll find them right away. <laughs> This is still one of your most important tools and probably the cheapest one you can get. Although I may need to use the knife to get some of this. Yeah, this bump is not well. I don't think it's going to affect how this is going to work, but it just it's unfortunate that it's in a very uh, unpleasant location for trimming. All right, that's not too bad. One thing too, you can, I wouldn't say cheap, but if you have issues with the suspension system, you, you do have the, the luxury of dirt and mud that can hide any imperfections because as I've, I've, I've uh, heard from historians and tank people in general, is that tanks, they don't drive over the terrain, they drive through the terrain. So they would accumulate all kinds of muck and grass and whatever it drove through would be clinging to the, <laughs> to the suspension. So cleaning a tank was uh, part of the daily maintenance, getting the mud and all that off the wheels, especially in a place like Russia you know, where that mud would freeze possibly overnight and then good luck getting that thing moving in the morning. So maintenance was very important. And I even give you another story about issues of maintenance fighting out in Russia. So during the Battle of Stalingrad in 1942, it started in the fall and went into January, February of 43. So the Germans that were trying to take the city from the Russians, their armies that were outside the city, you know, to protect the the units that were inside the city, they had a uh, perimeter set up of tanks and all kinds of equipment. 
so the tanks were were dug into these positions in the in the plains in the you know the countryside that were dug in and they were covered with hay to, to both camouflage them and to try to protect them from the cold weather so they were dug in and stationed you know all around this area in case the Russians decide to do a attack from the sides or come around through the country but what they neglected to think about is while these tanks were dug in in these positions that mice got into the tank engines and the mice ate all the wires so when the Russians did attack and the Germans ran into their tanks and tried to start them up nothing happened because all the wires were eaten away can you imagine? Yikes. Tough morning for those guys. <laughs> but hey. All right, so if you can see that. I'm wearing green. It's making it even worse to see. This can spin, which, you know, don't expect that your model is going to operate, you know, because it's, it's, it, it's a plastic model. It's really meant to sit on a shelf or be on a diorama. So it's not really going to run very eff effectively. You won't be able to push it, you know. So, but it's nice to have them movable, so that when you put the tracks on, you can adjust, you know, and roll the, the track over the wheels to try to get it to lock in place better. Okay, so that doesn't take too much, and you've got the rear idler wheel set up. And there's the drive sprocket, as I showed you earlier. Trying to see what we get going on time here. Be careful. We get a busy day lined up today. All right. So the other suspension system, the main, what they were called bogey wheels, is a little more to this step. So this is put in a system so it's supposed to be able to adjust the shock of the wheels and be able to you know, move up and down. So this takes a few different parts to get this together. So let's take a look at how many parts are involved here. There's, there's a number here. So let's get, all right, it takes a B10. I'm gonna use one of these flat point blades here to cut some of these pieces out. Maybe that'll help me save some time here. I'm hoping to get some different equipment to film these videos a little differently. We're looking into that here at the library. So we're kind of low tech right now, but we'll see. <laughs> There's little bits of extra plastic here and there that I have to sand down, but nothing major, so it's not... I've seen some models that have lots of extra plastic on it, and there's a lot of scraping, filing, and... Oof. A lot of work to them. These kits are kind of light on that. These are also fairly affordable. Tamiya makes some kits that are pretty cheap. This one is on the low end, so this is not a bad one to pick up. Like I said, it's not bad for kids. Price is reasonable. So, uh, let me see. We need some tires. Doo -doo -doo. I don't know why I'm looking. This <laughs> There's only one type of tire in this thing. Chop those. Ones. Send that down a bit. Not gonna get too crazy today. I'm going to clean that up more later, but for the sake of the video, we're going to get this moving. 17 is this one here. So I remember when my nephew was young, we built one of these. It was a fun project for the two of us to work on. Especially on a cold winter day or a rainy day. It's a fun project to do. Okay, so we're starting to get somewhere. 
So I got the, <laughs> it's hard to see. Uh, but let me start lining up the tires. Got a blob here I don't want. All right, so you don't want to glue the, the tires, you know, the wheels in there, because you want these to be able to spin too. Like I said, mostly to help align the treads and everything in there. So those sit on there. Uh, okay, now I'll get this upper suspension piece, which is, Number 16, looks like some sort of octopus over here. <laughs> Octopus's garden. Some of you knew that I was going to do that. Beatles joke, huh? <laughs> and lastly, there's a plate on top. I think it's, I think it's over here, yeah. You can see a bit of like a kind of spring mechanism in here. What's interesting is some of these tanks are around. Um, you can see these, uh, for example, at the American Heritage Museum in Hudson or Stowe, Massachusetts. I think it's Hudson. Uh, they have a battle every year. Well. When COVID's not around, they, they have a battle every year, and they do have a steward that takes part in that battle, which you can watch it drive around and shoot, which is kind of fun. That's usually around Columbus Day. And there are some sitting around. There's one, I believe, at Dedham. I, I'm trying to think if it's a Knights of Columbus Hall or an Elks Lodge. I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's one parked in front of it. So if you're in the area, drive by, take a look, because it's one just sitting right there. You can, it's nicely painted. You can... It's beautifully restored. I don't know if it runs, but it, it looks fantastic. So you just can just go take a drive and go, hey, look, there's a steward. <laughs> That's what these are, you know, called the steward light tanks. So, okay. Getting ahead of myself here. Let me get this piece. Just checking on the time. Don't mind me. This is when the new uh, bifocals come in handy. <laughs> All right, can't even see this, but hang on. You'll, you'll get a sense of what this is in just a moment. Like I said, hoping to get some different uh, camera equipment to work with here. All right, this is going to go down. Oh, we'll drop the glue. All right, the idea Okay, so that's in there. You just have to glue the the central pin. And then this piece is going to go in here. So not to juggle here. This tended to be the, the trickiest part of the model, but with patience, and if you're working with a kid, it, it's not it's not undoable. So you just may need to. Uh, there it is. Oop, pop that in there. So for this, the tricky part. camera to focus on this so you get this piece here but it has 
these little arms that come out and you're gonna try to get them around the tire and then the tires the wheels will move okay so you have this part here and I will get the whole bottom see what the whole bottom looks like usually these are in good shape which it is I think it's going to need a whole lot of sanding a little bit to pull it really well. Not too bad there. Yeah, I mean the molding's great on this. So you get your whole piece. So you see, there's a hole, there's a notch in there, and you're just going to glue, put some glue on this here. Oh, it's a tiny pin down there. And then they go into that hole there. Like so. That's a strange angle. I don't know. That looks slightly off. I don't know why that looks off. Thinking it's fine, but it just looks slightly off. I don't know why it does. But... I'll move it to the back and see if it's better back there. So that pin goes in there, and there's another. So there's three connecting points. All right, I'll put it back here. I think it fits better back there. The drive sprocket would go on the front. Looks like this just glues on in this one, which is kind of unusual for a Tamiya kit. Usually there's like a rubber piece or something that would hold that in there, but this doesn't seem like it has one. Looks like that just sits in there. I think it just, just plumps in. That's, that's surprising. I guess so. All right, um, let's look at how the idler wheel goes on. It looks like I got the idly wheel for the other side here. <laughs> All right, there's a slot. And a pin. Yeah, that's not too bad. Oops. Glue is dripping a bit here. So,
I'll get that to pop down a little bit better. Anyway, <laughs> I could have paid more attention to which side I was doing what on, but you get the idea. So there's there's the uh, yeah the idler wheel is there. I've got a couple of bogies on that side. Got one drive sprocket ready to go. Uh, I'm not going to do too much more today. I'm going to take a look. Well, we good for time. Yeah. All right. I'll try to put a rear plate on the back just to hold this uh, thing together. And then we'll start looking next time on you know, the top of the hull. I'll give you a quick preview on the steps with that, what that will look like down the road. So here's the rear plate here. And when you're doing something like a rear plate, you know, this big piece here, it's always good to check on the diagrams to see exactly what side goes up and what side goes down. Because it can be really vague in the instructions, and it is pretty vague here. But let's take a look at the... Well, that doesn't help either, does it? <laughs> um, hmm. Got two engine. All right, so it looks like the engine doors are up. Let's see if I have another illustration that might show the back panel a little better. Yeah, it does on this one. So the doors, if you can see the doors, that they are up, not down, like this. So I'm gonna try to drop this piece in. I'll give you a quick sneak peek of what will be coming next time. It's one thing I like about this glue, although if you're using this with kids, I recommend you work with them with this, because you don't want them to eat this. Not that I think your kids are going to eat it, but you know, there is a child-friendly glue, which I'll show you in a second. I know I've showed it in previous videos, but Give you a quick look at what that is. Oh, listen to that. I love it when it snaps into place just right. And boom, yeah, there you go. Rear plate is on with no fuss. Love it when that happens. So yeah, there is a child-friendly glue, which I think I have got one right here. My handy dandy box. Yeah, so this is a child-friendly glue. This is a non-toxic version. The only downside is it's a little slow for this stuff, stuff to dry, but if you're concerned about those issues. Um, I tend to like this one because you've got this nice applicator. You can draw a good line with it. It dries quickly. You just have to be sure you're monitoring people that are using that. So next time we've got the top of the hull to work on, which has things like the exhaust, armor plates, light bulbs, you know, the headlights, uh, armor plate for the front, and then you get into the turret, which isn't a whole lot to this to the turret on this one. It's a small turret with the 37 millimeter cannon, and there's an antenna, which is always tricky to do. That's always a last minute thing to do because that tends to break. There's an option on this, which is kind of fun. I'll show you this better. So these tanks originally came with these extra machine guns on the side. It had two machine guns on, on the side of the front as well as one in the turret with the main 37 millimeter cannon. So you could add these, which they did at the beginning of the war, which is what this is. This is uh, when the United States invaded uh, Morocco uh, to wrestle it from the Germans and the French that were pro-German. Uh, so this is in the desert. And so they had the machine guns here. And what the tank crews discovered is that these guns are slightly redundant. and it took up a lot of space in the vehicle. So it was common after, after the first few battles that they removed these machine guns 
because they thought they were cumbersome and the, and more importantly, it took up a lot of room inside. They wanted to take the gun out and fill this with more storage, like especially extra ammunition rounds and things like that. So it was common for them to remove these. But that's an option you can do with this kit, either yes or no. So, all right, so we'll look at where this goes next time. So happy modeling, okay, bye.